In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so go to Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to go to verse 3. Now, this is, um, this is something that's very interesting when the Bible describes what's actually inside the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? He says here in, in verse 3, And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, so that's telling you where the covenant of God is positioned in the temple. It's telling you that the covenant of God, this is the holiest of all. It should be the same in our hearts, right? We are now the temple. We each are now the temple. Our hearts are the temple, and our hearts are supposed to be the holy of holies, okay? Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were, now this is inside the ark, the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Now, each one of these things represents something spiritually, okay? Um, the tablets are the law, okay? That's the tablets that that was written for Moses, carved by the hand of God himself, right? That wrote the law. So that is, that is given by the Father. Father God is the author, or he is the originator of the law. Okay, that came, the, the, the tablets uh, were of the Father, and it was manifested by the law. This is showing you that all three persons of the Trinity are involved in our salvation, okay? Amen. The law is also involved in our salvation because the law is what shows us where we come short. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, the law shows us how we have sinned and how we have fallen short of the glory of God and why we need the Savior, right? It gives us the diagnosis as to why we need the cure, Okay? And um, so the tablets are from the Father, and they were manifested by the law. The manna represents Jesus. Now, if you remember in the story, they received manna from heaven every day, and they would go out and gather it, and they were told not to save it except on the day of the Sabbath, because if they tried to save any from the next day, it would be rotted, right? Right? But, if, but on the day of the Sabbath, they would get it, and then they could get enough for two days, and it would still be good on the second day because they were told not to go out and gather it on the second day, right? They were going to rest. They were observing the Sabbath, right? So it didn't rot until after the second day. Then they had to repeat this process every day the whole time they were in, in the wilderness, okay? But... They gathered some and put it in this golden pot and put it in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, and it never rotted. It never rotted away. Now, that represents Jesus Christ because Jesus is the bread of life who came down from heaven. He sustains us, and he will never die. He'll never rot, okay? He might have went into the grave and he was resurrected, but he did not rot like we do in the grave, right? He did not. So the manna represents Jesus, and in the New Testament represents the bread of life, okay? Represents the bread of life, that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, the third thing that was in the ark was Aaron's rod that budded. This represents the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that raises people up from the dead. The, the rod was a dead stick. It was just a piece of wood. It did not have any life in it. But it budded, which represented the resurrection unto life. That's what that represents in the New Testament. It represents the resurrection. It represents being born again, being resurrected into life. Okay? So you've got the law, which shows you where you come short. You've got the Savior, which can gives you the bread of life, which is able to preserve you forever, right? Mm 
the Word of God, and then you have the Holy Spirit, which is able to have you be born again, and essentially that's you being spiritually raised from the dead, yeah. right? Okay, so that's what was important about what was inside the Ark of the Covenant. It represented all three persons of the Trinity, and it represented, spiritually speaking, how we work, you know, how we get through our salvation. It represents our salvation, okay? That's why it was so precious, okay? Now, he goes on to say, Aaron's rod that budded, the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Overshadowing the mercy seat. Now, why would God have a mercy seat sitting on top of the Ark of the Covenant? Because that covenant represents the mercy of God towards us. That's what it represents. That we had a mercy seat. You could sit right on it and make judgments from it. And it is the mercy seat. And it represents the mercy of God towards us. Okay, so all of this stuff is symbolic. Even the cherubim are symbolic. There's two of them. One on each side. Okay, one on each side. Now there's some different artist renditions of that. Some of them have it with... They had their wings like this, where this forms the arm, and then this is the back, okay? And some of them have it where it's like this, and you sit down on it and rest your arms on it. Some of them have where the wings are like this, and it's just the arms. I don't know exactly, well, nobody really knows exactly what it looked like, okay? They, we really don't know. But the two cherubims represent the cherubims that guard the tree to life that God put in the garden when man got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And those two cherubim guard the tree to life. They are on each side of the tree of life, which is also symbolic of the covenant. It's the covenant of God, okay? So all that is very, very interesting. So I want you to understand that the reason that I want to go over this is because I want you to see the seamless melding of the old and the new covenants that they they do not exist apart from one another like yeah. when andy stanley who is the false teacher of this giant church over in in atlanta said we've got to unhitch ourselves from the old testament that is a foolish thing to say Amen. extremely foolish while we don't live by the Old Testament covenant, we live by the New Testament covenant, we, there is still much knowledge to be gained by the Old Testament. There's still a ton of wisdom in there that gives us a better understanding of the New Covenant because they don't exist separately from each other. They are complementary of one another. One is the root, the other is the tree. Okay, The root is the Old Covenant and the, and the flowering tree that produces the fruit of the church is the new covenant, mm -hmm. okay? So think of it kind of like that. All right. So if you would now, turn over to Matthew 23, 23. Go back a little bit to Matthew 23, 23. And we're going to see where Jesus is talking about something that is important. And it again talks about the Trinity. Talks about the Trinity. Okay? All right. Here in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus says this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, that's not a compliment to the Pharisees. It's not a compliment. When the Bible says woe to you, uh, that's really bad. That means that you've got a judgment coming. You've got, you know, have you ever heard people say, only God can judge me? <laughs> uh, you, it, and people on the streets, we tell them, look, you know that's bad, right? <laughs> if God were judging you right now, it would th you'd be a lot worse, okay? If, I mean, if we let the word of God judge us in this life now, we even let other Christians judge us and, you know, it, by the word of God, that's one thing, but if you die without Christ and God judges you, you're not going to have a good day. 
it's you're going to have a bad eternity. Okay, so if you just leave it to the end of your life to let God judge you and just do whatever you want, uh, it's not going to work well for you. So we always tell them, you know, that's like bad, right? That's that's, that's worse. You think you think you're upset with me trying to judge your behavior based on what I see in the scriptures. You get upset over that. You wait till God does it. Trust me, it'll be a lot worse. You would rather have me doing it. Okay. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish. Now he's talking about their religious traditions. Okay, Jesus told them at one point, you make the word of God of no effect by your traditions. Unfortunately, man has this really terrible habit of taking what God says and then reinterpreting it to fit what they want, like King Saul did. He wanted to keep the Amalekite king alive so he could parade him around and be really prideful, and he wanted to keep all the animals alive. When Samuel, speaking for God, told him, you need to kill all the animals. You need to kill the Amalekite king. Don't leave any of them alive. And he says, oh, well, I, I did do the, I, he told Samuel, I did do the will of God. And then Samuel says, then why am I hearing this bleeding in my ears? Okay, these animals are supposed to be dead. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be alive making noise. So he did not obey. He obeyed the way he wanted to. And that's what they're doing here. Jesus is saying, you're only doing things superficially. See, Jesus said in John 7, 24, do not judge by appearance, which is basically of the flesh, but judge with righteous judgment. That is, judge by the Spirit of God. Judge by the Word of God. He's saying that you're cleaning the outside of the cup, and the outside of the dish, but you're not cleaning up the inside. It's a matter of the heart. That's what's most important. Okay? So he says, you pay, uh, you pay, uh, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You have, oh, I, I skipped down to 25, I'm sorry, about the cup. Um, for you pay tithe of mint, and anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. So, you can't give lip service to God and neglect the true intent of the law. The true intent of the law is to inform us of God's standards and how we fall short and what we must do to fix that. Okay, So that's what the law does for us. Weightier matters of the law. Justice. Justice comes from the Father and it was manifested by the written law. Mercy comes from Jesus Christ, and it was manifested on the cross. Okay? And faith. Faith comes from the Holy Spirit and is manifested in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because you can't have, as Pastor said today in, in, in his a message, it's impossible to please God without faith. And you can't really have faith without the Holy Spirit. You can't have, it is impossible for us in the flesh to have faith, enough faith to stand against the world and stand against the devil, the wicked ones, and, and go against principalities and, and darkness of the rulers of this age. It's impossible for us to stand against that apart from the faith that we acquire and the strength that results from that by the Holy Spirit. We must get our faith from God. God enables us to have the strength to have faith. Okay? A lot of that is part of our choice, but it is really the baptism of the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to walk in that choice, to exercise our faith. Okay? We must have strength to exercise our faith. And... Um, if you don't exercise your faith, your faith gets a little flaccid, gets a little, gets a little weak. Okay, so I wanted to go over that, the Ark of the Covenant portion of this message, to show you that the New Testament and the Old Testament are linked, and you, you can see 
You can see the Savior in the Old Testament, just like you can see the wrath of God in the New Testament. You know, if you read the Old Testament, all you see is the wrath of God. You don't see his mercy and his grace, and you don't see, you know, Jesus in the Old Testament. You're just not reading it very well. If you don't see the wrath of God in the New Testament, well, you're just not reading it very well. You know, some people think that the Old Testament's all wrath and the New Testament's all love. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's both. <laughs> the full character of God is represented in both covenants, right? The, whole, the full character of God is represented in both covenants. All right. So now let's take a look at something in the Old Testament. This, I call this the story of the names because it tells a story. If you go into, and we don't have, you don't have to go there. You don't have to go to Exodus um, because that's a very long teaching. It takes way longer than what we have tonight. But I'll give, you the, I'll give you the definitions of some names that are involved in the story of, or the events of Exodus, okay, where Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt through the wilderness and eventually, years later, crossed over the River Jordan into the land of Israel, the promised land, right? Okay, so the word Egypt actually means oppression. The word Egypt means oppression. The word Pharaoh means one who spoils. One who spoils. Okay? Moses one means... Spoils? One, huh? Did you say one who spoils? One who spoils. Okay. Yeah. Moses means one who is drawn out. Because he was drawn out of the water, right? Out of the, out of the Nile River. Okay? He was drawn out. Okay? Manna means allotment or portion. Is what that means. Allotment or portion. The wilderness of sin is pretty self-explanatory. That's pretty pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Joshua means savior. That's a that's the Old Testament term for Jesus, essentially. That's the Old Testament word for Jesus. Jesus was New Testament. Joshua's both names mean savior. So Joshua means savior. Jordan, as in the Jordan River, means judgment. It means judgment. Okay, And Israel, the word Israel means one who prevails with God. One who prevails with God. Okay? So we know that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and away from Pharaoh, right? He led them through the wilderness of sin and God sustained them by manna that came from heaven. We talked about that earlier, about how it came every day, okay? Give us this day our daily bread, right? That's exactly, that's exactly an Old Testament version of that, right? Give us this day our daily bread. And it, and it wasn't very exciting. You know, I'm sure it didn't taste like steak and eggs, it, you know? And they even complained at one yeah, point. Yeah, they got tired of it. Yeah, they got tired of it, and they complained. And God was upset with them about complaining, you know? Uh, because better is a boring meal with God than living in bondage. Now, all of this has spiritual meanings, okay? The slavery over in Egypt represented slavery to sin. That's what that means. That's what that stands for, okay? So Jordan means judgment. Israel means one who prevails with God. So here's the story in the names. If you are in oppression and you are, you are enslaved by the one who spoils, then the one who is drawn out will lead you through the wilderness of sin, and your allotment from heaven will sustain you until you come to the judgment of God, and then by the Savior you will cross over when they pile the waters 40 miles high, and you will cross over on dry ground, and you will not be touched by the judgment of God, and you will become one who prevails with God. Do you see that? 
The story of salvation in Christ is contained in the names of the story of Exodus. You can do this with any set of names in the Bible. You can go, and I would challenge you to go to the book of Luke or any, there's, uh, there's two books in the New Testament uh, in the Gospels that have a list of names. It gives you, huh? yeah, Matthew, and I think the other one's Luke, right? It has a, one leads to Joseph, which is um, which was Jesus's um, uh, father, gar guardian father on earth, and then the other one leads to Mary. Both of them came through the lineage of David. Both of them did. But if you go and you take those names and you find the meanings of each one of those names, it's a it's a characteristic of Christ. It tell it gives you a description of the character of Jesus Christ. And if you put it all together and you read it like I just did, that, you know, if you, you're led out of the oppression of slavery and away from the one who spoils, then one who is drawn out will lead you through the wilderness of sin. You'll be sustained by an allotment from heaven until you come to the judgment of God. Then the Savior will lead you across dry ground. You'll become one who prevails with God. That's the story in the names. You can do the same thing in Matthew. You can do the same thing with those stories of names. In the New Testament, they're not just not just the names of Jesus' lineage, but every every lineage in there. Well, you can you can. Um, I haven't studied the lineages of other people yet. Okay. I have not, so I don't know for I can't tell you yes or no on that. I can't tell you what I don't know. Okay. But I do know I have studied the names of the lineage of Jesus, and every single one of those names, absolutely tells you a little bit about the character about the character of Christ. Okay. It gives it gives you a description of Jesus. I think when you did it before and you, you you did a lesson on that that it actually told you the story of Christ too. Well yeah I I, I just did. I told you this is this is this Joshua no. was the savior. Right no I meant the in the in the when you go through the lineage of David Oh yeah, if I do if I do the New Testament, and I can do that later. We can do that in another lesson where we go through the whole names of the lineage of David and all of that. Because there's was there fourteen generations between I think that's right. From that's Adam right. to that's David and then from David, yeah, there's fourteen, then there's fourteen more. Yeah. So yeah, you go through those, it gives you it's that's a long description of what Jesus is, is like. It gives you a long description of him of him. Uh, but it also How tells a story. What these names mean? Uh, you can look them up in like uh, strong concordance and stuff like that. You can look up the names, okay. and uh, and they'll tell you what those what those names mean. Okay. And it's very very interesting. Out, so. Yeah. Now, if you would turn over to um, <coughs> Joshua chapter three, we're going to start in verse thirteen. Joshua chapter three. Start in verse 13. We go 13 through 17. Joshua 3, 13. Okay. And let me find my place here. There it is. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord. The Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. Okay, so that's talking about judgment. If you look at this spiritually, okay, uh, what does it say in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15? Hold your place here in Joshua, and let's take a look at that real quick so we can get an understanding of what is actually going on here in the spirit. Turn over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Hold your place in Joshua. We'll come right back to that. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
So the soles of their feet went into the water. Basically, the judgment of God only touched their heels, right? The bottoms of their feet, okay? So that's kind of what he's describing. So when Jesus went into the judgment of God on the cross, he stepped in and, and Satan only bruised his heel. Okay, he only bruised his heel. But God told the devil, he'll bruise your head, and the head represents authority. So, and some translations say crushed his head. He crushed his authority by going to the cross. So this is an Old Testament representation of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. The Ark of the Covenant, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the law, the manna, and the rod that budded, representing the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, goes with the priest, and, and Joshua was in the lead. He was leading them, right, which means Savior. He stepped into the waters of judgment. Now, what does it say here? Um, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So it heaped up the water. It just stood them up, right? And basically pulled the river off the riverbed, okay? They, right? they went over on dry ground. They went over on dry ground. So it dried it up. Dried it up. That means not one iota, not one jot or tittle of the law condemning you for your sins is going to prevent, you see what I'm saying? The judgment of God, when you walk across, because the Savior went first and dipped his feet in it, and he crossed over and dried up the ground, when you walk across, you've got total victory. You're not even walking on damp ground. You're not, there's not one drop of that water in that riverbed that's going to touch you. Not one drop of the judgment of God is going to touch you when you cross over the God's judgment and become one who prevails with God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. he, because Jesus stepped into that water and piled that up, the judgment of God piled it up and away from you, and it's really interesting what he does here. I'll, we're going to finish here in a second. Um, but it means that you're not going to even touch it, the judgment of God. You are completely, just like the Bible says, your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. It's like it never happened. It's gone. Completely gone. Because Jesus stepped into that judgment and it only bruised his heel. Because of that, you don't even get bruised on your heel. You get through completely free. That is the mercy of God. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All right. So it was, in verse 14, it says, So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. Remember, God's, his promise goes in front of us. Mm -hmm. It goes in front of us. It goes ahead of us. Okay? Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. So he was in front. Okay? Bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan... And the feet of the priest who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. So it was at <laughs> flood stage. Floods represent the judgment of God, especially when the word Jordan is associated with it because it means judgment. So in the end of time, at the end of the age, at the end of these last days, the judgment of God is going to come like an overflowing river to the world but it's not going to touch you it's not going to touch you you might get some tribulation and we'll talk about that here in a second you might get some tribulation you might get some persecution from man you might suffer the wrath of the devil a little bit but you're not going to suffer the wrath of God at all if you're in Christ if you're born again in Jesus Christ you will not even get wet going across you'll cross on dry ground Okay. So, but the rest of the world is going to get a flood. That the waters which came down from upstream stood still. Now that's that's pretty much a miracle right there. The whole river just stopped, just stood still. 
okay, and rose in a heap very far away at Adam. Why do you suppose it was heaped up at Adam, a town called Adam? Well, because that was a spiritual representation of when the judgment of God began. Okay, when Adam sinned, sin brought death into the world. So no death is going to touch you when you cross over to God's judgment. You're not going to be touched by the second death. Not at all. But God told Adam and Eve, on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. So the judgment of God began with Adam. That's where it began. And when we just read it here a minute ago in, in, Gen in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, he first pronounced curses. Everything else before that time had been a blessing. Everything else was good or very good. Everything else was a blessing. This was the first time that a curse was pronounced by God for anything on the earth, and it was because of mankind's sin. So it says that the water came down from upstream and stood still and rose in the heat very far away, very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. Now, I looked up the meaning of the word Zaratan, the name. You know what it means? Tribulation. Interesting that Adam and his sin is associated with tribulation. They're very closely linked. It says here that, uh, and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the sin of Adam is what has led to tribulation in the world. You know, when we get tribulation, it's, it's our own fault. It's not the fault of God. God gave us a perfect home. He gave us a perfect place to live. Everything that he made was filled with life and love and perfect relationship. And we alone have messed that up. But God is such a loving God and such a merciful God that in spite of us wrecking this whole planet and every war that's ever happened, that's everybody, every baby that's ever been aborted, Every person that you love that's ever died is our fault. It's our fault. Because mankind sinned against God. And God only came to give us life and life more abundantly. But it's our fault. And in spite of that, in spite of all that misery, God still sent his only begotten son so he could step into the edge of the judgment of God and pile that water up and you could walk across on dry ground and God's judgment would not touch you and then you would become one who prevails with God. What a loving, merciful God we have. Isn't that amazing? And you can see this in the Old Testament. That's what I'm saying. If people can't see the love and the mercy of God in the New Testament, they're just not studying the Word very closely. They're just not looking at the Word of God. They're not studying it out. But if you study it, you can see the mercy of God represented in the Old Testament. You can also see the wrath of God in the New Testament. You know, I mean, if you read Revelation, that's full of wrath. <laughs> Men are hiding under the rocks saying, hide us from the judgment and the wrath of the Lamb. You know, the wrath of the Lamb. So Jesus is going to bring wrath. Okay. The city is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea failed and were cut off and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. So they were, Jericho was the first place that they were going to go and get victory in the new land. They were going to, and they did it without firing an arrow. They did it without drawing a sword. They, they just marched around seven times and then they blew the trumpets and God made the walls fall down and they got a victory. God gave them the victory. And they blew their horns too, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They blew their horns. They walked around seven times and then they blew their horns and the walls fell. God did that. They didn't have to. They were, they, they were probably way, way, there was way fewer of them then than there is today. And they, were, they may have been completely outnumbered by the city of Jericho. I have no idea. We don't know how many people there really were. We don't know how big Jericho was, but we know that um, God 
God took the walls down for them. Well, they were pretty good sized Israelites because it was 12 tribes. Yeah, it was 12 tribes. And um, there's an interesting, um, you know, I used to always be really bored with the book of Numbers until I started actually studying it. If you, let me, maybe get a pen. Let me see that pen. I'll show you something else right quick. We have time? Oh, yeah, we have plenty of time. Got plenty of time. If you go to the book of Numbers, and you'll notice when the Israelites would camp out, when they would camp, okay? They did it in a certain order. Yeah, they did it in a certain order. That's right. And I'm going to give you a little illustration of that. In the center, they would put the tabernacle, okay? That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, and and they this was a temporary temple is what it was that they would take it down move it and then they would reassemble it okay that was the tabernacle all right so they put that in the center and then they had if you look at the numbers if you actually look at the numbers of how many were in each tribe okay it, it you it will tell you that some camp to the north some to the east some to the west and then there was a much larger group that camped to the south Okay, so if the tabernacle was in the middle, there's the symbol that it made, the cross. You can see the cross in lots of places in the Old Testament. And then you have like, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or I'm, I'm missing two tribes, but basically the 12 tribes were laid out. I guess you'd have to put two more down here like this. They were basically laid out kind of like that in the shape of a cross. So if you were to stand up on a mountain at night and overlook the campfires of the Israelites, the Hebrews, you would see a cross in light out there in the wilderness. That's what you would have seen. Pretty amazing, huh? That's pretty cool. But the, you, you look at the numbers, how each one camped to the north or to the south or to the east or the west, and you put the, actually put it to paper on the numbers, and that's what it'll show you. It'll show you that it's the, uh, uh, it's the shape of a cross. Everything in the New Testament is highly symbolic, highly symbolic, pointing towards Christ. Everything in the Old Covenant points to the cross in the future, and everything in the New Testament points back to the cross in the past. Because the focal point of our salvation is the cross of Christ. That is the focal point of our salvation. And there's only one event that's going to be more, maybe, I'm not sure it's debatable, but one event that's going to be more important than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, and that's going to be his return. <laughs> the rest of us get to go with him, and the world is, all the sinners are destroyed with a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, and then he actually takes possession of the earth that he earned back on the cross. That will be the biggest event in all of human history. The biggest, because everybody's going to see it. Every eye shall see. And then it says the nations will mourn. Well, why are they going to mourn? Well, because they didn't listen. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's true. Here he comes. We're doomed. Too late now, so they're going to mourn. Won't do them any good, but they're going to mourn. Does anybody have any questions?